Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. The club is designed to give you a certain height for certain distances. And the other thing that people don't understand are the laws of trajectory. The laws of trajectory are very simple. The further you propel an object, the higher it goes. The shorter you propel it, the, the lower it goes. So when you're hitting a shot, for instance, if you say five yards off to the left of a bunker that's on the left side of the green, and you have to say it to the green, that ball's not going to go very high. But everybody has this tremendous picture of the ball going high, and they hit it right in the middle and knock it right in the bunker. So the mental picture is always the ball going forward so that the club gets a chance to meet the ball in the face of the club, and then the face of the club, which has the loft, gets the ball in the air. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, Here's your host, Fred Green. Our guest was introduced to me by Mike Corda, a Golf Smarter listener from Massapequa, New York. Or is it Massapequa, New York? So in Mike's email, he said that the book Understanding the Golf Swing by Manuel de la Torre has changed his view of golf forever. Well, that was enough for me. Manuel de la Torre has been teaching golf longer than most of you have been alive. Not everyone, but most of you. But that's just teaching. He comes from excellent golf breeding, so not only has he been at it a while, he was born with it. He's in his 80s, and he's still teaching today at the Milwaukee Country Club. So his book is a wealth of information loaded with photos, descriptions, and drills. But now we have him here with us. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Manuel. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for giving us your time. I, we found you because one of our listeners has read your book, the Understanding the Golf Swing, and told me that I needed to get you on the program because the amount that he learned and the insights that he gained from your book were so valuable, he wanted me to share it with everybody. Well, that's very interesting. I'm glad he got some benefit out of it. Now, you have a very interesting history um, where... You've been playing golf all your life, but probably even longer than that, correct? <laughs> <laughs> probably so. <laughs> tell me tell me how you got started in golf. This is very interesting. Well, my father was the first Spanish golf professional at the age of 17. Uh, he was a very fine player as well. He won the Spanish Open six times. And uh, although he never pushed me into it, uh, he was very helpful in helping me play, and uh, I have still have the, the three clubs that he made for me when I was about 18 months old. So I used to hit it both ways, right-handed and left-handed, so my clubs are worn both ways. But it was um, kind of a falling in love with the game, I guess, and uh, I just uh, took to it, and uh, I enjoyed it very much, and I still do. And your father, um, being also a professional, he was an instructor as well? Yes, he was an instructor. He was a professional at the Real Club de la Puerta de Hierro, which was where I was born. I was born in, in the little apartment he had above his pro shop. And so he was the head professional there, and he, of course he taught. And um, then he used to play the, the tournaments in Europe. And one time when he was playing in, 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 uh, in England, he met Ernest Jones. And uh -huh. that's how everything started. And and so he worked with Ernest Jones for years on, on developing the golf swing? Well, and it wasn't that they would work together. They became what Ernest Jones had to say about the golf swing was a very was very appealing to my dad. And so he just followed what Ernest Jones used to say and uh, then he had took it over, so to speak, and used it in his teaching. Of course then he taught me about it. And, of course, Ernest Jones and Dad became like brothers. We were at each other's houses all the time. When we came uh, to New York, and, my, of course, Ernest Jones was already here, and, and um, we used to go to each other's houses all the time, and I used to listen to them tear the string apart and put it together, and strangely enough, I, when I was six years old, I could understand what they were saying. Yeah. Some of the things they're saying today, I don't even understand myself. <laughs> well, you mean today when they talk about the golf swing, you think that they're, it's not what you learned? 
No, not at all. And it's so complicated that if if I had to play golf the way they teach it today, I probably would take up tennis. <laughs> so you were saying the, that the, golf has the, gotten the, too complicated, and it has, and that's why scores are not going down. That's right. I mean, if they're making it so hard, for, and in the swing, swing in motion is such a simple thing, and you know, kids have no problem doing it. It's true. And yet, when we when we become adults, we complicate it to such a degree that. Uh, it won't work, and it, like, it can't work because of the complicated approach that we give it. You know, it's such an interesting point that you make because I, I've frequently noticed that it's much more difficult for a player like myself who started later in life than for people I've played with that start when they're, they're children. They just don't, you know, the people that I play with that started when they were like yourself, starting, you know, at, at 18 months old or, or 6 years old or 10 years old, they just don't think about the swing when they get up there, and they have much greater success. That's correct. Than That's someone correct. like myself, that it's just I'm on my head is swimming with information every time I step up to the ball. Sure. And today, of course, the thing that I complain about mostly about the teaching is that nobody teaches anything about the club. Everything's body positions and body contortions and stuff like that, and no two bodies are built the same way. So no two bodies are going to be put in the same position no matter what you do. Well, go ahead with that. What do you mean they don't talk about the club? Well, they're talking about the, 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 the body positions and the knees and the hips and get the hips out of the way and all that kind of stuff. Right. And those things are natural reactions to the motion of the club. Mm, keep going. Well, it's just like throwing a ball. If you throw a ball overhand, that their body acts a certain way. If you throw it sidearm, it works a different way. If you throw it underhand, it works a different way. Now, you wouldn't say that you throw the ball in those different manners because you make the body do something different. The body's movements are a response to what you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my father used to say to me, the body never does anything wrong if you don't do anything with it. You leave it alone and let it respond to the motion that you produce. And that's why no two bodies will ever move the same. So where does the golf club come into all of this? Well... The, the golf club is a tool that's placed in your hands to do a job of propelling the golf ball to a target. It's just like if you were a carpenter and I had found a tool that, that works very well to do a particular job, I wouldn't tell you how to move your knees or your, or, or, or your elbows or, or your head or anything. I would teach you how to use the what? The tool, of The course. tool, of course. <laughs> oh, you're making it sound so simple. <laughs> well, it is. But oh. this is, the, this is the, the unfortunate part that... It's being made so difficult that many people say, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And uh, I can't blame them because it's, it's just too, too difficult to approach the game in that, in that fashion. And there's been a tremendous amount of uh, technological advances in golf club development as well. Has that made it better or worse in your, in your perspective? Well, the handicaps aren't going down. Right. So that's, that's, that answers the question. Now, it may be easier to swing the club because they're lighter and, and, and they're more forgiving because you have more area to, to hit the golf ball. But uh, when I was playing competitively, I always had my driver made out of a three-wood block and my three-wood out of a four-wood block because I wanted something small and compact. Because I, I wanted the mass behind the ball contact. Now with all this tremendous area... Uh, you know, they're making clubs so you can swing badly and hit the ball well, which I don't like, if you do know what I mean. <laughs> well, yeah, let, let's, let's talk about that a little. What, what's the problem with swinging poorly and, you know, and still getting some results? Don't, don't we want to find, find the right tools for <laughs> what we're doing? Isn't that what you just said? Well, I, I think for the average player, it's okay. Right, but I, I I can't say in, in anything you do, you don't want to do anything poorly and get good results. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're if you're a person that that likes quality, you want to make a good swing to get a good result. If I make a bad swing, I don't want to get a good shot. Mm. No, I want to get a good shot because I made a movement and I made a good effort to make the to do the right thing. How do you feel about the hybrid clubs that have uh, recently? It's, well, fine. It's come out onto the I market. Have, I have no 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 qualms with any, with any, with what anything is with anything that's on the market. Mm -hmm. But the, the the hybrid clubs is is more psychological. Now, they, some of them have the, the same loft as a three iron, and not because you put all that stuff like a wood 
people say, gee, I can play it. Now you take all that stuff off and now they can't play it. So there's a lot of psychology involved with it. Certainly when somebody comes to me with a hybrid, I don't tell them about this because I don't want to destroy their confidence. But uh, uh, the hybrid club has made people play three irons very well. So I should not say, well, they're no good because they are. It's just a different way of of, uh, having equipment, which is perfectly okay. Yeah, perfectly okay. Very interesting. Now, when we were speaking before we started recording, you'd said that that golf, there's so many ways to relate to golf with the everyday activities that you do. Sure. Please, please, let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, Okay. Explain that. Well, if if you were trying to hit a, if you had a post that you wanted to drive into the ground with a hammer, Mm -hmm. okay, with what would you lift the hammerhead up to get ready to, to, to strike the blow? The handle of the hammer? No, 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 you're your holding arm. the hand. Oh, your arm. No, you wouldn't. No? <laughs> you would pick it up with your hand. Okay. But now once you get the, the stroke on the top of the, of the stroke, to apply the power, you apply it with your arm. Right. Okay. So I've misunderstood the question. I... Okay. <laughs> so, so when you're swinging a golf club, you're doing exactly the same thing, except that you're doing it with the golf club, and you're doing it in, in a plane that's different, it's not an up and down, it's more of a backwards and forward motion. Mm-hmm. But the action is the same. If I wanted to, if I had a wall that I wanted to take down and use a sledgehammer, I would be using the same motion that I would use in a golf swing. Mm-hmm. If I'm playing tennis, it's the same thing. I'm using my arm to apply the power and move the tennis racket. If I'm using a baseball bat, I'm using my arms to swing the bat to hit the golf ball. And yet today, everybody says, well, the power's in the legs and the power's in the feet. And, well, I can't see that. Really? You see the difference? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're saying it, it's, all, it's, it's more of your arms. It's, it's coming from the hands and the arms and not your hips, not your legs, not the power from there? That's right. I have a little drill that I do when people start telling me about the, the hips and the legs and so forth. And I, I, have them, I stand in front of them with my hand extended and I put the club in my hand. So they do, and they say, now move your hips and your legs as fast as you can to your left, which is the same direction that they would hit the ball. Mm-hmm. And the club stays in my hand. Doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> and then I say to them, okay, now let's not worry about the hips, but I'll move your arms as fast as you can, and that club just flies off. Mm. So, you know, it, it, these things are just normal, everyday things. And I use examples of the car, the way we drive the car. When you want to turn your steering wheel, what do you use to turn your steering wheel? Your hands. No, you don't. <laughs> I'm failing this test miserably. I'm... Well, th- this is what happens. You see, you all have the, these ideas. You turn your steering wheel with your arms. You hold it with your hands, but you turn it with your arms. Okay, yep, you're right. Sure. If you had a steak on, the, on a plate and you wanted to cut it with a knife, what do you move your knife with? Your arms. That's correct. Hey, I got one Every, right. <laughs> everything you do is, do is done that way. So why, when I have a golf club, should I change? You see my point? Mm-hmm. We haven't established yet, and I think it's very important, is um, do you mind me asking your age? I'm 88. I will be 88 in October. Well, happy birthday. I hope you have a wonderful wonderful birthday. So when you started doing this with your father and Ernest Jones, this was a long time ago. I mean, you've been at this for quite a while, and you've been working on the golf swing and the development of the and understanding the golf swing for quite a while. You've seen a lot of different swings through the years, haven't you? Oh, yes. Well, this is my 61st year teaching. Amazing. I've been at the club for for 59. And, And which club are you at? Milwaukee Country Club. And you've been there for 59 years teaching? Yes. Unbelievable. That's fabulous. Congratulations. Thank that, you. That's really wonderful. Um, I wanted to, if, if you don't mind me addressing with you, um, I want to talk about the game from 10 yards and or 30 yards in. I know okay. that there's so often that we'll take our approach shot. You know, we talk about the 100-yard and in game where you're, you're hitting a wedge in, um, but you know, you don't always land on the green. You're, you, you're coming up short. You're going in a bunker. You're going wide. You know, you're just, and that's where it seems to be 
I mean, I know how many times I've I've been uh, on a par five. I'll I'll be green high in two shots, and it'll take me another four to get into the hole. You know, because I'm not on the green, and, and it it's a very frustrating part of the game that doesn't get discussed as much as a hundred yards and in. Sure. Well, the, the 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 main problem there is that people don't don't practice the proper type of shots. Everybody's married to to wedges all the time. And the wedge is not the best club to use all the time, especially if you're 10 yards off the green. That's the worst club you could use. Really? Absolutely. The best club to use is something like a little 7-iron and, 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 and pitch and run it. Uh-huh. So you want to keep the ball low and let it roll. Yes. We have in our business a, a, a kind of a, a rule that says that get the ball on the ground as early as possible. Mm-hmm. And when you're that close to the green, you certainly don't want to get the ball up in the air. Now, if you, I gave you a ball from the same distance that you're talking about, and I said to you, now, let's say you throw the ball underhand and get it as close to as you can to that hole, what do you think you would do? Depending on how close the pin is to the uh, edge of the green where I was coming from, that would, well, that would make a regardless, difference. Regardless of that. Well, would you throw it way up in the air? Or would you roll it? Oh, I would. I would try to bowl it or roll it. Yes, I that's would roll the normal. The right, that's the normal. So why in the world would a person get ten yards to the green and throw it up in the air? Right. That's not. That's not normal. Mm-hmm. So again, we're trying to do things with a golf club that we do in other phases of our life. Very good. Very good. So now, what if you have, say, you're um, you're on the just outside of a bunker. There's a bunker in between you and the green. And the... That's a different situation. Right, right. Now, now you, of course, you're forced to use the wedge. Mm-hmm. But the club gets it over the bunker. You don't. Mm. That's what they put their loft in the club for. Your job is to send the ball to the target. Isn't that correct? Yes. Where's the target? Yeah, on the other side of that bunker. I know, but where is it? My target is on the green. Yeah, but where is it? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean. Where's the hole? Oh, let's say it's in the back part of the green. No, where is it? Where's the hole? <laughs> it's right there. Where's any hole? It's in the on the ground. It's in the ground, isn't it? Yes. Okay, we got there. <laughs> okay. So why I'm are we sorry. trying to get the ball up like in the clouds? Idiot. Say again. I say if it's in the ground, why are we trying to get the ball in the clouds? Well, it, don't we try to get it to land softly and not roll far? That's the club's job, not the, your job. Uh-huh. Your job is to send it forward to the hole, which is on the ground. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, now I'm getting with you here. So, um, again, do we, do we do changes in our swing or our stance no, on situations no, like that? Is that what yeah, happens to people? The, no, no, no. You make the mental picture different. Instead of trying to picture the ball going up high, you picture the, go, the ball going straight forward, and the club gets it over the bunker. Mm-hmm. Do we not spend enough time visualizing what the ball should do? Well, you do. We should visualize what the ball should do because that controls what club we use. But regardless of what club you use, your target is always on the ground. Yes. And, and you're so, seeing that people miss that point. Yes, absolutely. They, they go by the mental picture of the shot. <clears throat> now, when I... If I wanted to go over a tree, I would say, what, with what club, what club will get the ball over the tree? I wouldn't say, with what club will I get it over the tree? Uh huh. But then when I'm swinging the club, I'm thinking of the ball going straight out, or like it's going underneath the tree, and the ball goes over the tree because the club gets it over the tree, not me. But do we try to finesse the swing too much? Do we try to make the club do things that it's not meant to do with our hands and our body? Too often. That is correct. That is correct. Uh-huh. The club is designed to give you a certain height for certain distances. And, and the other thing that people don't understand are the laws of trajectory. The laws of trajectory are very simple. The further you propel an object, the higher it goes. The shorter you propel it, the, the lower it goes. So when you're hitting a shot, for instance, like, like you say, if you're, say, five yards off, to the left of a bunker that's on the left-hand side of the green, and you have to set it to the green, that ball's not going to go very high. 
Right. But everybody has this tremendous picture of the ball going high, and they hit it right in the middle and knock it right in the bunker. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the, the the mental picture is always the ball going forward, so that the club gets gets a chance to meet the ball in the face of the club, and then the face of the club, which has the loft, gets the ball in the air. How much time should we spend um, on uh, on the, our body position on a short a short shot like that, where you want to keep the ball low, you just want to let it roll up and stuff? Is that a normal stance, or are we putting more yes. weight in one yeah, yeah, one side of the anything. other? I don't change anything. I keep my balance the same. I put every club in the center, and I do everything the same. One of the things that people always want me to do, or they want to do, I should say, not me, is they want me to make them consistent because they want to be consistent. So consistency means you do the same thing every time. So to me, balance is very good, and the only place that you can be in perfect balance is if your club is in the center of your stance. So you don't think that uh, having the ball farther back in your stance for some clubs and and closer to your uh, left feet if you're a right-handed hitter, you know, farther up in your stance um, for, say, your longer clubs uh, no, is because, correct? No. I disagree with that 100% because the moment you start putting that ball more to your left foot, your, your shoulders open up. Sure, sure. So always in the center of your stance. That's right. Now, is it the ball that's in the center of your stance? No. no, the club. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that because that was a nuance that I noticed in your book I thought was really interesting. It's, and it was such a subtle nuance, but it's not that the ball's in the center of your stance, correct? It's the club. Yeah, please, go on with that. Because that seems to be a very common mistake. Yes, because I, even when I, when, when I try to get people to put the club in the center, they always say, well, I put the ball in the center. I said, I didn't say that. It's the club in the center. And, of course, the ball is next to the club, not with the wood, because the club is beyond the shaft line. That throws the ball more towards your left heel. And it's a right-handed player. So the ball ends up about two, two inches from the left heel, which is what we used to talk about years ago. Now with these big, big clubs, they want the ball teed up high enough the left foot, and people just hit the ball all over the line. Mm-hmm. And they're not hitting it straight. That's right. They're hitting it farther, but they're not hitting it straight necessarily, correct? Yeah, well, of course, lighter clubs can be used. You know, you can swing them faster because with the same energy, you can move something faster if it's light. But the problem is today that they have longer shafts as well. Well, longer shafts are harder to control. Do you think that most of the drivers that people are using are too long? For the average player, yes, I think so. Do you think they should be cut down a little bit? Yeah, I think they should go back to the 43 and a half inch that they used to call standard years ago. For the average player, I mean, the, the tour players, you know, the, the, the people who play for a living, they can use anything because they play every day and they have the timing to do that and they practice a lot. But the average player, sometimes I get people that say, well, I'm going to play in this event and that's the first time I'm going to play this year. Well, you give them something that's hard to control, and they're going to have more troubles. Sure. What do you see as being the most common mistake that amateur players are making when they go out? They don't practice the short game. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest mistake, and I can see it even in my own club. They go up there, and they, they, they take a driver, and sometimes that's the only club they take up there. To the driving range? Yes. Yeah. And and there's so many different shots that you can practice on your short game. I know that, you know, some people just, they'll take a wedge, they'll take a couple swings, you know, try to get a 30-yard or a 50-yard shot in, and that's it. But they're just trying to loft the shot, sky it very high, where you're saying there's many shots you need to keep low. Yeah, my father <clears throat> used to say to me, when we, when we work on my game, he used to have me get a target, and then once I, I picked up a club that I sent to that target, he said, okay, now let me see you see, send the ball to the same target with every other club in the bag. Really? Yes. And that included the woods. That would be an interesting but, drill and a difficult one to do. Well, it's not difficult. It's the same swing. The club gives you the different, the different shot. The, the player doesn't get the different shot. The club does. Right, but you make I mean, the to, same swing. but you're you're saying to you want to pick one target and hit that target with your your five iron and your nine iron. 
your five iron, your nine iron, your three wood, your driver, with all the, all the clubs. To go after the same target. Yes, sir. And and is that one of the things that is missing out is shot making ability? I mean, that's that's correct. That's that, correct. That's what's changing with all this uh, high tech equipment that people are losing sight of how to be shot makers. They just want to have sure that they want more clubs in their bag. I think. <laughs> yeah, and I think that nowadays people have four wedges. I don't have four wedges. I have one one pitching wedge and one center, and I can play all kinds of shots with all those two clubs. If I want to play a lob shot with my pitching wedge, I just lay it open and play the same shot that I always play. I I've noticed that when I try to open up a wedge like that, you mentioned opening up a wedge, um, how do I do that without making it so that it changes the direction of where the face is going? Well, when you open the blade, like whether you're in a bunker or whether you're playing a lob shot on the fairway, mm -hmm. uh, you have two directions, one for the club face and one for your swing. Okay. And those two directions compromise, and the ball comes out in the middle of the two. But it's not it's the like leading edge. I'm sorry. It's not the leading edge of the club, which direction the leading edge of the club is faced. It's more of not what your swing pattern Not if it's open, no. Yeah, because it's open. Well, if it's open, it's going to change the leading edge of the, the direction the leading edge is going, correct? That, that is correct. So then you compensate with that by your swing? No. You, you, what you do is you set yourself left. So that if you had the club square, you would be aiming, say, uh, 10 yards to the left of your target. Hmm. And that's the way you would swing. And then the club face would be setting it to 10 yards to the right of the target. So when you combine those two, the ball comes right in the middle, comes out right in the middle. Okay. It's just like if you have had the bars going up the Mississippi and one target is pushing, pulling to the right and one is pulling to the left, which they would. And then the bars goes out in the middle. Hmm. Very good. Manuel de la Torre, thank you so much. The book is called Understanding the Golf Swing. Is this book available um, on Amazon.com? Yes, it is. And it's also Barnes & Noble and Borders. They all, they all have it. Okay. You can read this book. Uh, it's got a fascinating history and some very interesting concepts that are so simple, it's going to kind of rock your world a little bit. You'll think it's... It's too simple, but really it makes a lot of sense. And the other thing I liked about the book, Manuel, is that you have a lot of uh, practice exercises in here that go along with your explanations. Yes. But everything that, that is physical, the mind is also the one that controls everything. Very good. And it's very important to bring that up. Uh, it's in the book in, in, in the section where we're talking about the observation and feel and so forth. But the mind controls it. A lot of people work on the physical side, but they don't work on the mental part, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So true. Thank you very much. Best of health. Have a happy birthday. We really appreciate you coming on the Golf Smarter Podcast. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And thank you very much. Boy, wasn't that enlightening? So often when I contact someone about being on the show, they have a basic understanding of how podcasts are like radio shows on the Internet. But this guy is 87. Have you ever tried to explain a podcast to an 87-year-old? <laughs>